Hello and welcome to the Now Spinning Magazine podcast with me, Phil Aston. And in this episode, I'm absolutely delighted to have with me American singer-songwriter Mary Fall. Mary's most recent album, Can't Get Out of My Head, made my top five albums of 2022 last year. And I can safely say I've been playing it every week since I've had it. It's absolutely a beautiful album um, with some of my favourite songs on it. Really, really is. So welcome, Mary. Welcome to the Now Spinning Magazine podcast. And how how are you? I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. And and uh, it's uh, a little bit of spring in the air today. So I, I love that. I, I know you live in, in Penzance. Penzance I'm in Cornwall. Yeah. We're not, not far yeah. from the sea, but it's quite rainy and blustery today. Okay. Now, I first became aware of you um, via a video for Going Home from the album The Outside of Time. The song was played in rotation in the UK on a UK on a TV channel, which we had called O Music. I think it was called Classic FM before that. It's about yeah. 2004-ish, I think. And I think that was your first album since leaving the October Project. Roughly. Right. I got, yep, yep. I got signed, you know, I had, a, after I left October Project, I never wrote music with October Project. I was, I was the singer. That's it. And yep. um, so I, I had to learn how to do that. I, I really did. It was very frightening for me because the bar, October Project was, was a good band, two, two albums, but really well done and <clears throat> very soaring, a lot of harmony and everything. So I had to learn how to be a writer. And I, 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 and I put a band together, um, a band that most of the members ended up forming their own band called Olabel. If you know Olabel, they're fabulous. And, yeah. um, but anyway, I, I, um, I gave up trying to get a deal at a certain point. I was playing out with the band. I was trying things and I thought, well, I'm never going to get a deal. So who cares? And I started performing. I studied medieval history and literature at college and, I started incorporating some of that little bits here and there and just things I like to do because I thought, who cares? I don't have to be commercial. And because I did that, I sang a song in uh, um, sort of a, a medieval uh, a language that's a combination of Spanish and Arabic called Mozarabic. It was from the 11th century. And lo and behold, I came to the attention of Sony Classical because they were looking for something like that, someone who could cross over different genres. And yeah, yeah. they had me come up and audition and I did it. But they didn't know what to do with me, but they said, you know, we think you're kind of cinematic, so we'd like you to write for movies. And I saw they were doing this Civil War film. And my dad used to sing these beautiful Stephen Foster songs to us yeah. when we were little kids. And so I thought I'll write a kind of a Stephen Foster song for this movie. And um, and it ended up getting into the film. And that's how I ended up on your television screen. And um, but wow. I will say that the that video, I premiered it. I hadn't seen it before I showed it to my family. And they sent me, I'm like, oh guys, let's let's watch this together. <laughs> I didn't realize that there were parts of it where I'm kind of rolling on the ground and and I I I was I I was very embarrassed. At one point my brother looked at me and because when I turned over on the ground I have I I have sort of very buxom, you know. <laughs> he said, you should just put a post-it note on there with your phone number. <laughs> it was really embarrassing. So anyway, but uh it it's an interesting thing because it confused that song ended up confusing, I think, radio. And um, the song, the album itself is a, is very eclectic and a mishmash, but they wanted me to write for movies and sing with an orchestra and do an aria. And, and so it confused radio. So it is my most popular song. If you go on Spotify, yeah, yeah. Um, but it also in one way, just it, it it was hard because it kind of ruined me for radio and they stopped playing my stuff, my stuff. And um, so it's, it's odd. I've had an odd career. <laughs> because uh, that's it, the story and it, I tried to condense it as much as possible. Very good. But, so you, you, so it was, because that, that album is very, it's like this Celtic, there's English folk, there's, there's okay. uh, classical music, it's operatic. Yeah. It was yeah. also, I can see it was a complete melting pot of, um, of musical styles, but you were oh, able to write like yeah. that. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I, 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 by the time that came around, I had, I had got more confidence in writing. It's very, you know, it's a scary thing because you have to be bad at first. You write a lot of bad so at least I did. And <laughs> then I started to get comfortable and I found my own way. And I, I like writing for movies or books or I, I don't typically like pulling things out of my own life. Um, but I, you know, anyway, um, it was that, that album was probably too eclectic, uh, but I love the fact that it takes you on an interesting journey, which is what I like to do in my live shows really. Uh, it, well, so. well it, so it certainly does. But then if that wasn't challenge enough, um, for, for doing such an, a, a varied album and going yeah. from not, not writing anything to writing for film, you then decided yeah to, as you put here in the notes for your DVD, to climb Mount Everest by covering an album that most people wouldn't go near, Dark Side well, of the Moon by Pink Floyd. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a gutsy girl, okay? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I just don't know any better, but I... Yeah. I had grown up with that album. Um, I had I, I had older siblings um, and they were I was a little I was a small child in the 60s. So I had teenage siblings that had great and all very different record collections. And so I was privileged to have all of that streaming. But my older brother was the. Prague person and I didn't like a lot of his stuff because it was sometimes it's just too many notes as you say like yeah, yeah. Of, you know I call it boy music but for me the Pink Floyd <laughs> I could always sing it and I always resonated with the lyrics and the scent the overall sensibility so when uh I, my contract was not renewed with Sony Classical everyone who I knew had left or got fired and um for various reasons and I was very disappointed, and I, but I just remember I. It takes me about two months to get over something, and I, you know, you dry your tears, you put on a little makeup, and you put. I put my favorite hat on. <laughs> I went into New York and got myself a manager, a new manager, and the new management company said, you know, you can either go out and be a girl with a guitar, and there are so many of those, or we can try to do something really interesting. And I said, well, like what? And he said, why don't, why don't you redo a classic record? And I was thinking, well, what would I do? I mean, I don't know. That sounds like a terrible idea. And then I was thinking, well, I guess, I guess if I were to do one record that has such deep meaning for me, it would have to be Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> there you go. And I, I feel like, whoa. So they put, and but wisely, they put me together with two producers and that record that's that's I don't even call it sort of a, a Mary Fall record it's such those producers especially David Werner who had had his own career he had been an artist called Wizkid he had such a ferocious vision for that record and I I was able and I, I felt so safe with he and Mark Doyle just making this record on spec basically I drive up to Syracuse and and layer by layer, but hit it was David Werner's vision, and he let me try everything. And he and so a lot of I'd say my philosophical input into that record in terms of the just the heart, the soul of it, but the music of it was was David and and Mark, once again Mark Doyle, who is you know, been my producer on my last record. And uh, so between Mark and I just were able to just fly and do whatever we wanted. And then we just honed it all down. And, and, and then, of course, Bob Clearmountain came in on that record. And as a favor to us, he mixed that record and he, he did the surround mix, which was lost in a fire for years. We thought it was gone. And, um, the, lab the label had folded, V2 had folded yeah, before yeah. the record was ever, you know, it's another <laughs> another heartbreaking music industry story. And But Mark, during the lockdown, COVID lockdown, Mark, with all that time on his hands, found the, the surround mix and we had it re, uh, remastered. And um, it it's, I just think that surround mix is, is really stunning. I hadn't heard it in years and, and, Oh my God. It's so, because that album is so layered, it's just made for surround, you know, 
it, yes, it's yeah, it is every different way. Yeah. And but you, so, you, you're right. It's kind of, although it's seen as a progressive rock classic, it actually has a lot of pop sensibilities in the songs. The songs are very oh, pop orientated, really. Um, very much. Yeah. You know, some wonderful. And, and I, I mean, I was listening to it um, this morning and I love uh, Us and Them. And, and any colour you, li- you like, which is an instrumental, obviously was, but you've, you, you take it to a totally different land. Um, so did you, must, did you have a lot of fun kind of exploring where you could take the, this oh, music you'd known for so long? I had a ball making that record because the, because David and Mark, I always, I always feel, I felt very safe with them. I never felt judged and they'd say, try this, try that. And for me, I had a, a, um, spiritual and philosophical through line for me. Yeah. For me, that is sort of a... You know, uh, like Kurt Vile's Seven Deadly Sins, it's a song cycle, kind of a classical yeah, yeah. cycle. So that's how I saw Dark Side, and I felt it was an allegory of a human life, and that it takes you up and down into the and back up again. And so I wanted any color you like to be kind of, I hate, <laughs> I, I don't want to be airy-fairy, but sort of, I a shamanic kind of thing, you know, where yeah. it's just speaking in tongues and, and um, that's, that's where I was at when we did that. And, and for each of those songs, we had to come up with a completely original approach and uh, like on money, we tried money many, many different ways. And first we tried a big band and it's like, no, no, that didn't work. And then ultimately we came up with that very sort of uh sinewy yeah yeah like vulgar i wanted it to be vulgar yeah you know um and uh and, and so and when i sang that in particular um i remember overhearing these two women um from some some foreign country but they were talking like this and the, the woman kept saying, but it is more money than that. And I thought, that's what it is. It's money. Okay. Yeah. And so anyway, I had a ball doing that. And um, it was nice to to sort of find it and re-release it. You know, it, it, so, it was it was really, you, really you, you said it was almost like, um, in some cases, almost like a, a spiritual experience of approaching an album like this. When you, when you look yeah. at a track, when you look at a song um, like... Gosh, it's just flipped my head. The Great Gig in the Sky, which is a song without words, but a song with so much power and so much feeling and meaning without saying, without having a single light lyric. How what was how did you approach that? Were you kind of apprehensive? No, of what first of all, I'm not you 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 know, the original, um, what was her name? Claire Tory. I always could Claire Tory. I, yeah. I, I was gonna say Claire Trevor, but that's another that's a yes. brief encounter. Okay, the actors. So Claire Tory and you know, what she did is so soulful and unique. You, you can't do that again. And for me, at that moment of the song cycle, for me, it's a it's a it's mourning. It's a M-O-U-R and I it's it's a mourning song of of realization that life is not what you thought it was, or the realization that, oh my God, things are so corrupt. It's it's all of that hitting you at once and that that dawning on you and and so that's that's where I was coming from when I sang that. And um, again, it was it was just that that's the lowest part of the journey. And then you begin you begin to climb back out slowly. And the next song, I think the next song is is. Uh, it's uh, it? it is us and well, it's a uh, money, isn't it? And us and them. Money. And then, yeah. So that and then yeah. and then it becomes that the that the life enters that period where you are cynical it's like you it, now you've entered the area of cynicism and yeah. then another realization with us and then the other thing see i love i roger waters i gotta tell you in many ways the man it was a prophet and and i i think whatever you think of him or his politics or anything i know he's very interested in world war one and its effects yeah. on the rest of the century and the future. And I, I have an interest in World War One as well. And I I really feel like 
that was the beginning of the end in many, many ways, the decisions that were made and um, this, you know, and, and the subsequent fallout. And, and, and I, fe I feel that with, with Roger Waters all the time. And so I, I just, I think I, I just, I, I resonate with his, with his sensibility. I get, I get what he's, I get what he's talking about, at least for, for me. And, and so I think that that comes across on the yeah. record. No, it's it's fantastic, and because obviously what we're looking at it now, it came out. You, as you say, during lockdown, it was found, and it's out now, and it's fantastic. Yeah. It's in Blu-ray five point one, but of course, it was recorded a long time ago, and then you thought it being lost in a fire, and yeah. this was coming quite soon after Sony Classical. Um, you know, <laughs> Just didn't I call it? Didn't not renew my contract. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, there was a there's a there's a gap then uh, where you obviously have to almost find yourself again musically. Yeah. So the dark side was fun, and then um, you know that, ha and then I was ready to really give up, completely give up. I I really, you know, you get your heart broken a lot, and. And then uh, I decided, well, I'm going to grow a garden. I'm going to learn how to, because I don't know anything about that. And I should learn. So I threw myself into that. And because of that, I threw this and that and, you know, connections. I ended up meeting my husband. And um, he said, why aren't you playing? Why aren't you out working? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> he said, why? And then I said, because I, what am I going to do? And he said, you're going to go out again. And he just bullied me and bullied me and bullied me until I did it. And I said, I didn't think I was, a, I said, I'm going to have to go out by myself with just me and a guitar. And I said, I'm just not a good enough guitar player. And he said, well, then you're going to have to get good. And he dragged me out, Phil. It was so embarrassing to these horrible and he, my husband has his own life, a big life. He's, he's a, he's a research scientist. He's a deep sea oceanographer. He's, he's, does busy. all this stuff. Busy. He's a busy, busy guy. He would come <laughs> home from work and, and he would drag me out to these awful open mic nights. And, you know, I would say to him, like, I don't do that. Like, you know, the diva comes out. And I'm not yeah, really, a yeah. diva, but it came out. And well, like, oh, yeah, yeah. Don't do that. But you know what? He was right. He made me go out and get comfortable just playing by myself and grabbing a rowdy crowd that didn't know me. It was like starting all over again and grabbing an audience that didn't know who I was, didn't give a damn about anything. And, and then I, I, and I got better. And then I, um, I started to book shows and more and more and more. And then I started writing again. And um, and I had one of my old friends, John Lissauer, was uh, John Lissauer is featured very prominently in this latest Leonard Cohen documentary, which is very, yeah. very good about Hallelujah. And um, John had, had worked with with Leonard for, for years and um but he had done all the orchestrations for the other side of time for me. And we got along so well. So he said, why don't we, you know, bring me what you've written and, and let's put a record together. And he doesn't live that far. So I would, I started working on a record with John and then uh, I thought, well, I've got to, how, how am I going to tour this? I could have put a band together. So I went back to Mark Doyle and I said, Mark, can you help me out? Do you want to do this with me? And he did, and he put a band together for me, and he's been my music director ever since. And I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have him. He can do anything. And uh, was that the Love and Gravity album? Was it? Yeah, that was the Love yeah. and Gravity record. And then, uh, then we did our first show together uh, with this new band he put together for me. Was at this beautiful opera house in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, called the Mock Chunk Opera House. It's, it was at one time, it was a coal coal mining town, but one of the richest towns in America. So one of the uh, oligarchs, the coal oligarchs there built this beautiful opera house for his wife. Mm -hmm. and so we were, and they have a, a, a recording studio in the place. So the place is miked to within an inch of its life. So yeah. we recorded the record. We recorded our first ever Live concert. album. Yeah. And then we filmed it too. 
And wow. uh, so it ended up on PBS. And I, I, again, you know, sometimes I make these decisions and I, I bite off way more than I could chew. But in that case, it all, all the, all the stars aligned and it, and it came out really well. I, I still can't believe we did that, but we did. And, and then Mark has been my music director ever since. And, um, we did, uh, we ended up doing a Christmas record yeah. together, which I was loath to do because I don't like <laughs> Christmas re- music drives me insane. I can't stand it. So I, my husband said, you should do this. Your audience would love that. So I thought, oh, fine, I'll do it. And I thought, I'm going to make a Christmas record that I want to hear. And so I, again, I went up and I worked with Mark Doyle. And the thing about Mark is we make these records in his, uh, in his apartment. And yeah, It's a tiny, itty bitty little studio there. It's gotten bigger since. But the thing that's so freeing is I can try things and he records everything. And we just we work so well together because we we know each other so well and we have an immense respect for one another. So we can just say, no, that doesn't work. That does that, that. You know, we're not we don't step on each other's toes. Yeah. yeah. If he doesn't like something, he tells me right away. So we got that record done, and I ended up loving that record. And um, and then I said, we should, you know, it was the lockdown, and it was. I said, I've, I, I am, just, and my my my, as I write in the book, and I don't want to get maudlin, but it was a tough time because my sister had died of ALS, a very very horrific. Yeah. Fast moving ALS. I've never seen anything like it. It destroyed her within one year. And oh, then my, gosh. and I loved, I loved my, my older sister was like a second mother. And, and then my mother, who was very elderly, um, she died the same year and, you know, we're locked out and it was just yeah. bad. And I said, Mark, I got, I have to, I got to get myself out of this funk. I, I, and I just thought, and I also was feeling at the time and, this is where music just saves you. I I felt like I had lost my home base. My mother and my sister were were home that home that root for me, the roots and yeah, they yeah. were Christmas and every, you know and that's gone. It was just gone. And I thought so what else is my home and my home were those songs that I learned when I was a kid and Especially those songs when you are just starting to form your own taste. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I had my siblings who had all of all of their music went into my DNA. So my oldest brother was the folky in the house. So I had think of every 60s folk artist, you know, and um, and then my the Prague and then my sister who had, you know, the Mamas and the Papas and Petula Clark and all those kind of people. Yeah, yeah. And, um a lot of the girl music of the of the early 60s and mid 60s and all of that was just swimming in my house all the time and but then when i i turned 12 13 14 i had a boyfriend who liked british folk and and that was it for me and i uh nick drake five leaves five leaves left yeah one and um uh I love Judy in the Neil Young records, those, oh, just those, those early Neil Young records, uh, which is not British folk, but I, I started learning to play the guitar, playing those Neil Young songs. And, um, we had in my, my, you know, we, I grew up in a very Catholic family and, uh, there was a very cute young priest who played guitar and he taught me a lot of the Neil Young songs and I used to play them and I would lock myself upstairs in the bathroom of our house because it had good acoustics. And, and I just, that was, those, those songs are, are like home to me. And, um, and I just wanted to take, just go into a world of beauty. And um, so that Mark and I, we both needed that. And uh, so we spent like those 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 horrible dark months making this record, and it it really it, it just it saved me really. It just it it brought so much joy. And I, when you said to me that it was like the sun the sun for you, it brought out the sun. That yeah. that's what it was for me, and I think you can feel that in it. I, I definitely think so, and I think because in a lot of um, 
my videos, I, I say to my audience that music is the healer and the doctor. And I think that music is a, a big healer for people. And I also yes. think I agree with you totally that the music we hear in our formative years never leaves us, no matter what we, what, whatever we discover later on. The, the music that happens when we're kind of like 12 to 16 is just laser etched into our memories. I mean, I can't get it out of your head by ELO is probably for me it's their it, it's actually my favorite song by the band it's mine too <laughs> mine it's, too and and i the, i those songs are I, you know there there's a lot of layering that goes on and big productions but what i love is that those elo songs have what i call good bones you know like when you find a an old chair on the side of the road that you want to <laughs> fix up and paint yeah. and maybe reupholster yeah. it's like you look at it and you think this has good bones and those songs when you can pare them down to nothing and or or me with my my minimal guitar playing and the song still works and that's the mark of a great song and those elo songs you can pare them down that way and um they're not dependent on riffs or orchestration or, or anything and um for me that song used to play on the jukebox of the cafeteria in the catholic high school that my parents forced me to go to and <laughs> i i just it would from the moment i heard it it was it had that transcendent quality you know um it 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 just takes hold of you. It takes you somewhere else. I I love that. It still does that for me. Yeah, it's it's kind of, it's like a melancholy song, but it's also uplifting. It's kind of it, it's very it's just it, it's just very emotive, isn't it? It's dreamy and emotive, and and um, a song has to take me on a journey too while I sing it. Yeah. And um, the mark of a great song too is you never get bored with it ever, yeah. ever. And um and performing it, I I I just never get bored with that song. Ever. Fantastic. And then that's followed by Ruby Tuesday by the Rolling Stones, which again is a very it's a story it's a story song, isn't it? But it's it's yeah. full, again full of um angst and song. Yeah, it's I, hope. I, I did read that um, Keith Richards, I guess, had a had a brief fling with with. Some you know some bird I guess since she was sort of a free spirit and 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 that he wrote it about about that brief fling and uh, I just I loved that song when I was a kid I I loved those Brian the Brian Jones era Stones yeah that, yeah, yeah. a little bit of a classical sometimes feel to it they were a little more orchestrated um, when when he died the the band to I still love them, but they went in a very, very, really yeah, more different direction. Road. Very different direction. But I love Ruby Tuesday. I bought that single when I was a kid. That was one of the first singles I ever bought for Fantastic. On my own money. Yeah. The next one, um, Tuesday afternoon by the Moody Blues. Um, this, this, this is one that you weren't quite sure about. Well, you weren't quite sure whether you could. Well, do all this. right. I'm going to be honest. With, I, I, I. I, I wanted to do, I mean, I, again, I love the Moody Blues and, and used to play them to death. And, but, and that song was so good, but the, the bridge, I just never thought, oh, I don't know, it's a little, you know, fairy, fairyland of love. And I thought, oh, Mark, I don't know. I don't know. We've got to, we just got to reinvent that section. We just do. And, and I wanted, again, with Mark, I said, you know, I was thinking about Dark Side and I thought, let, let's let put some, it needs a driving something. Let, let, why don't you let me come up with some kind of a chant here? Because that's, we did a lot of that on Dark Side where they wanted me to do vocal stuff. And, and so I, I thought, let me think, let me think. You can always find good chance in the Bhagavad Gita because yeah, 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 yeah. it happened to me when I did Dark Side of the Moon that I I wanted to find that quote from Oppenheimer about um because Robert Oppenheimer, the inventor of the atomic bomb, and when he first beheld it, he's he looked at it and apparently he was a Sanskrit scholar as well as being a physicist, and he wow. uttered in, in Sanskrit, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. And right. I think about it, and I'm like, I gotta look up that quote. I didn't realize that the 
in the the Gita is all rhyming. It it rhymes and it sings really beautifully. Yeah, it's like a big song, isn't it? Oh, yeah. oh. Mm. So I found it, and so I thought, well, hmm. Uh, I I had just gotten a reading from a, a Vedic astrologer, whatever you think of astrology. He's the best in the world, and he um, he had given me some some Vedic mantras to he's you know it's what yeah. they do, and and I thought. I wonder what it's Tuesday. There should be a mantra for Tuesday because they, they have mantras to the gods of each day of the week. And I, so I looked up the mantra for the God Mars on Tuesday and lo and behold, it sang perfectly. So I recorded it in the deepest voice I could find, layered it, layered it. We locked it in and it worked. And that's how we transformed the bridge. And that's what happens. So and now that's my favorite part of that song. I can't wait till it comes up. So fantastic. Yeah. Now next we're going to visit. Well, one one of my favorite artists as well is Nick Drake, um, and Riverman. Now Nick, I remember reading because he's such a, a a genius, but a very sad character as well. That when he yeah. was playing his early gigs, because he had such complicated guitar tunings he had to tune up before each one and his guitar playing was very unique to him so when you yeah. approach this did you did you have to strip this back to a totally different well, here here's here's the deal you know again that especially river man in particular which i just love to beyond i can't and i I said to Mark, we, we, we just can't go down, we can't go down the guitar road here because you're not, we're not, we have to make this our own, but we have to keep, for me, the cinematic, I think Nick Drake's songs are incredibly cinematic and we have to keep yeah. the shimmering. Most of it has a shimmering quality to it. And I, and I said, why don't you try this on piano and see, and Mark is as good at, pianist as he is a guitar player and he he just sat down and started doing this this riff and I said that that's it and I'm going to tell you something that happened and I um for me that 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 song just whenever I sing it it just grabs you and you're in Nick Drake's world then you have to surrender to his world and a few weeks later after this album was released I got a letter from the Nick from Nick Drake's family or his, really? His, wow. The, the Nick Drake. And it was the person who's in charge of, I guess, the Nick Drake Legacy yes. Foundation. And she said, um, whether you know this or not, you seem to what you seem to have done is to submit to the spirit of River Man before you adopted it as your own. This is often a rare, rare thing with Nick's music. So many wish to achieve to conquer the thing, as if by doing so it reduces it to a sport. Um, I'd let, and they ended up, this, this, I, now I, I don't want to get teary, but they ended up sending me a book of his mother's poetry. I'm hold this oh, up. yes, yes, yes. I've oh, actually, I've, I've, and, yeah, um, I've got, I've actually got that on my bookshelf. Yeah, it's a beautiful it. book. Um, yeah. So, and with a later suggestion that maybe, maybe at some point I might want to look at the poetry that yeah, she didn't yeah. have and maybe it's beautiful, beautiful stuff. And, and I love, I love her face. It's just Yes. It's a beautiful, that's a beautiful set, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, wonderful. It really is. Yeah. So that, that really, that really meant a lot to me. Oh, that's a lovely story. And uh, yeah. got a feeling by the mamas and poppers. This was, was this an influence from your, one of your sisters? Oh, Oh my God. I mean, I, I sing, the, I sing the way I sing again, a lot of the British folk singers like Sandy Denny, the Denny and yeah, yeah. Jay Bohr, those kind of people. Um, but I learned how to belt and <laughs> from the, from Mama Cass and um, my sister had all of their, I remember the moment I, I heard that first Mamas and Papas record and it just, I think I was eight or nine years old. It blew my mind. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever heard in my life. And um, so of course I sang along with it. And uh, I, I, that was one of the more obscure songs in, in their whole legacy. And yeah. so I thought I should, I should, and, and I thought the song should have had the original 
should have had a little more of Mama Cass's swagger in it. It's a little airy, breathy. So, um, and again, it's one of those songs that you can you can you can easily make your own. Um, but oh my god, I still love the Mamas and the Papas. I still play them. They're on my, you know, when I have my phone in the car and it's just yeah, it's scrolling on, through. Yeah, they're I on love, there. Yeah. The next one, Don't Let It Bring You Down by Neil Young, has been covered lots of times. But I have I to say, your, ver- your version is just sublime. It's beautiful rendition. I, uh, again, you know, I, I mentioned earlier why Neil Young was so meaningful to me. I mean, that, that song just has such power and, and relevance. It never loses its relevance, ever. Um, and. So, you know, you can put all of your ferocity into it, you know, which is what what I tried to do with that, with that. And again, I I said that if if I ever get dementia or Alzheimer's or something, I have a feeling that like my my hands would <laughs> still know how to play that song because I've been yeah. playing since I was a little kid. Yeah. Well, I remember when when they are, when I first got hold of the album, I was looking through the track listings. Think I could see how they were all kind of. Oh yes, I can see why that's on there. And then, of course, the next one was "Comfortably Numb" by Pink Floyd, which Absolutely. obviously, when I first heard this, I didn't know you'd 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 done "Dark Side of the Moon," but "Comfortably Numb" again is one of those songs where you think, well, this will be interesting, but it but it works really, it works so well. You you bring out the lyrics are easier to to hear and in a way the song now makes more sense in, in, in to, to me i even love the video you did yeah i um i don't know i just i i i love i've always loved pink floyd for me i um as i mentioned earlier i i just i get i i I hate to keep using the word resonate, but it's the best word there is. I just resonate with with the lyrics to, yeah. to a lot of the songs and the the sensibility, um, the philosophical outlook. And I mean, comfortably numb. I was trying to with the whole record. I was trying to keep the record within a sort of maybe six year limit of late sixties, early seventies kind of. Thing. But you know, this particular song came out many years later, and I said, "On the hell with it." Let's just throw it in because I have to do a, a Pink Floyd song. I just do. And I always wanted to, uh, as the Viennese say, put my mustard on it, you know. And yeah, yeah. It's one of those songs, too, that it's so singable, you know. And um, it has that that crescendo. And uh, anyway, it's another fun one. It's really fun to perform. It, it's fantastic. And, of course, that's... All also instrumentally because obviously the the song from through the eyes of a Pink Floyd fan is all about David Gilmour's guitar um, solo, and mm-hmm. but I think that the way this has been arranged kind of is a totally different way of experiencing the song. In a yeah. you know there was no need for for that to have like a a, a focal point on a guitar solo. I think the vocals are the instrumentation. That's that's my how I how I've yeah. experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think Mark did a, a, a beautiful, beautiful job with the arrangement. Yeah, it is. It is beautifully. In fact, all of, all of the songs are. And in fact, uh, one of the things I, I wanted to mention actually on the Neil Young one in particular is the strings, um, the real violins and cellos. It, it's, it's made. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, because a lot of people would think, well, we could probably use keyboards for this but i think the strings on this album are fantastic yeah well we're lucky mark has a group of uh, string players you know that he works with all the time and he's very very good at writing string arrangements and um he uh you know i again i always love the string arrangements on two people well i love the string the, the kirby string arrangements on nick drake those yeah yeah Brilliant. Snippy yes. Record. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, uh, which we couldn't do on the, on river man. So I did a vocal thing instead. I just, we just couldn't go there, but I also <laughs> love Paul, Paul Buckmaster Buckman and, and those early, you know, all the string arrangements that yeah. he did. And, and so I said to Mark, give me something like, I wanted this to, to hit a crescendo and, um, 
I wanted it to get orchestral and that's 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 what he came up with and, well it's, um, it's it's really it's really really good yeah. um and then you've got since you've asked by Judy Collins um who's, who's another person who's been a huge influence on you huge well yeah that was in my uh my brother my oldest folky brother had had all of her albums and I just I loved the I loved her eclecticism and she was always a great discoverer of songwriters and good songwriter herself. And we, I originally used to perform this version of the song with October project. We oh, yeah. never recorded it too bad. And, um, Emil Adler who, uh, did an arrangement for it, you know, uh, did a different arrangement for it. That was, um, in, in sort of a different time signature. And then I ended up, performing it with all of it, like the Olabel people when I, when I had them and they kind of added their bit to it and changed the arrangement a bit. And then when it got to Mark, I said, this is the way I've been doing it all these years. And, and, you know, and he sort of said, well, you know, don't, <laughs> if it's not broke, why fix it? So um, he added, he added his thing and the string arrangement and things like that. But it's been, it's been built from the ground up since my October project days. And um, I should have credited Emil on that. I didn't. I'm very sorry I didn't do that. But, it, um, you know, you're in a hurry when you're making these records. And uh, yeah, yeah, so anyway, yeah. but it is what it is. And uh, but it, yeah, I love Judy Collins. I still love her. She's a, she's a force of nature. Yeah, she is. She's still going strong now, isn't she? Um, absolutely really brilliant. Yeah. 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 Beware of Darkness by George Harrison. Was this an obvious choice? Oh yeah. I, oh yeah. yeah. Well, for I, I, one of those early records I bought when I was a kid was all things must pass. Of and course. Yeah. That record has stayed with me all these years, especially the lyrics. And I always say like, it's, it's so funny, George in anybody else's hands, a lot of his lyrics would sound preachy, but with George, it because George lived it, it was honest and beware of darkness is such an important song. And, you know, I always think about his buddies in that era, like, you know, Mick and, yeah. you know, uh, those kind of people, those dark lords of rock. And <laughs> we're just so not like that, you know. And, yeah. Um, Jimmy, you know, <laughs> Jimmy Page, people like that. Yeah. yeah. And George is always dressed in white. And, and yeah. But, um, that song, those lyrics have, have entered my head at various points of my life and been very wise advice. And um, so I had to do a Harrison tribute, a George Harrison tribute at City Winery with a bunch of other artists, you know, when they do those, yeah. it's like George's birthday or something. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do Beware of Darkness. And it, it went over very well. And it was just the obvious choice. And I started performing it at my solo shows. And um, yeah, I, and again, I wanted, I took, I, told Mark it was, it was a, it was a battle a little bit with him. I said, you have to de beetle it completely. You, <laughs> you, have, you have to take every flourish out. He's like, but, but it's like, no, it has to, no slide, no George, all yeah. of it is gone. And I also felt that, um, I mean, I love George's version of it, but you know, you just, you just can't do that. And, so I said, and again, make it more orchestral because it builds. I always, <clears throat> I like to build a song emotionally, you know, where it has yeah, a pay. Yeah. Not all songs can do that, but that song in particular, I felt could really use that. So again, Mark, Mark did that great string arrangement. Yeah. I mean, lyrically, it's very pertinent for the times we live in, isn't it? It's, uh, <laughs> you know. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh Yeah. Yeah, it happens to me all over again every time. Yeah, and the the final track is the Great Valerio, which is Richard and Linda Thompson. Uh, this is actually, as probably at the moment, my favorite track off the record. Yeah, I lo oh boy, now that was the scariest one for me because <laughs> she, you know, I uh, I just love Linda Thompson and I love her vocals on that. And I, I didn't, I really thought how what the heck are we going to do with this? And I said, Mark, again, Richard Thompson, very idiosyncratic yeah, guitar. Yeah. Can't go there at all. And because I sound, you can tell that Linda Thompson was an influence on me. You, you, Cause she was. And, 
So I thought, oh boy. So Mark is the savior of this song because he said, no, no, I'm going to give this a groove. And he did. And I, I said, the, you should make the outro really haunting. And he just took it to his Mark's own place. And he did that very sort of carnival-esque sounding organ at the end. Yeah. Which I just, that blew me away the first time he played it for me. And um, I, I just, I think Mark's arrangement on this is just maybe, maybe one of the most interesting ones on the whole record. He, he just outdid himself. It's, it's fantastic. Now the, the whole album is sequenced so well. It's yeah. like, I mean, it's, it sounds like a live set. It sounds like you could just do it in that order. I mean, was that, I know a lot of people will say, oh, they, we just, the songs, we just worked out roughly what we're going to do. But did you, or did you arrange oh, the songs to be? we think about them a lot. We, we, yeah. we sweat over those, yeah, the, the sequencing. And, and it's fantastic. It just, it just has to, again, it has to take you on, on a, a journey. journey. Yeah. And we try, you know, you, you, you spend like weeks just playing, like mixing them up all the time. And, but I thought that, that the great Valeria was a, was a really great outro because it's got that tag on the end. And, um, we play it live with the sequencing exactly as it is. It just works. And, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going to Portland, Maine this weekend, uh, and we'll play the whole record all the way through. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. that'd be fantastic because the, there's a melancholy feel to the to the album, but at the same time, it's very uplifting. It's always that the whole of the human condition is contained within this one album. Um, I, I, the notes I made this morning were the songs bring you into the present moment and become the sound become the soundtrack to whatever you're doing at the time. Um, oh. Because because I've noticed when when me and Sue have played it in the car traveling somewhere, it's like the yeah. soundtrack to our journey. It's like the the music the music fits in with whatever the weather's doing, and um, whatever we're feeling. So it's a it's a absolutely wonderful album. I played it to uh, my younger sons, and they they love it. It's How just old are they? Uh, well, my youngest son is twenty four. My oldest son is thirty, and um, I mean um, my old, my my eldest son is a singer songwriter, and he loves Nick Drake. So oh. your version of Riverman's fantastic, but. As I say, the whole album is just wonderful. Now, the other thing I want to say is that you've also done a 5.1 mix. Everybody watching this or listening, you must buy this album. Um, and it's quite usually when I'm when I have a 5.1 mix, it's usually a progressive rock band or or it's some classic album that's being. But this for for your album to be done in 5.1, which sounds beautiful, but did you? That's it. Seems like quite an unusual decision to make. Well, Did you always want you know, to do that? Well, ha after Dark Side, I started. You know, I didn't promote the the Dark Side five point one really much at all. I mean, I got it out there, and then a couple of you know online people that are interested, and in, you know, groups online and on Facebook that are five point one aficionado. They, they yeah, they liked it, and it was sort of a you know, pass it around and word of mouth. And I started getting an audience that were people that are, were interested, you know, audiophiles. And so it was, Mar Mark said, you know, Mary, we, we should follow up and do this in 5.1. And, um, and there were songs on the record that were suited to like, like Tuesday afternoon. And um, what happened was that I said, well, we can't go to California, you know, it's locked down. And yeah. I said, what? And then he, we found out that Valhalla Studios, which is, you know, Ronald Print and his wife, uh, Darcy uh, Proper, they are one of the premier surround mixer engineers, yeah, uh, yeah. mastering engineers in, in the world. And his approach is very different than Clear Mountain's approach just different style. But Ronald Trent had done a lot of work, I think it was in Belgium, where they, he's European, um, he, where they had studied how it, doing these surround mixes, how the frequencies affect you mentally and physically and the effects. And so he, he has this very interesting approach. That's and interesting. I mm. think you feel that with this record. When, yeah, when you yeah. Feel what the other thing is, 
Now, unfortunately, I live in a very old house. So it's, if you, well, you have a lot of, you know, you know, old houses, it's yeah. little room, little room, little room, you know, <laughs> to keep the heat in. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So it's hard to find a place where you can sit right in the middle of middle, a room yeah, experience yeah. 5.1. Um, and so I don't have that in my house. And, but once you've heard these things in that whole audio scenario, there's just no going back. There's no. no going back. You just don't, I mean, there isn't. I mean, no, I always no, agree. vinyl and having a good vinyl system and that, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, 3D quality. It's the, it's the, it's the cinematic aspect. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's because life is 3D or well, 4D, isn't it? So it, yes. it's the feeling yeah. that, it's the feeling that it's, I think that's why it feels so, um, so I've been absorbed by the by the, by the yeah. song. I can't think of the words, but you're kind yeah. of like you sink into it. It's like a yeah. it's like a meditation almost. You just sink down it amongst the amongst the music, which yeah. again on on the on the on the five point one disc, the bonus tracks are the strings mixes, aren't they, of Ruby Tuesday and Tuesday yeah. afternoon, which which are fantastic, absolutely beautiful. Um, then you can really hear the beauty yeah. of Mark's arrangement. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. So you said that you've got some gigs coming up, haven't you, where you'll be playing this album yeah, in its entirety? Last, yeah, yeah. I um, So, you know, going all over the country, Atlanta, Portland, Maine, Philadelphia, New York, um, uh, probably Phoenix very soon, places like that. Just, just, I, um, I want, I just love this record so much. And uh, I, I, I wanted to take the whole band um, to these, these various places. And I want, I, I wanted people to, I play a lot of these songs by myself, but it's not the same. You know that. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I really, I wanted them to get the full feeling of, of this and, uh, without, of course, the orchestra, I do have to bring a keyboard player to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Unfortunately, yeah. you know, that someday. Maybe. Yeah. It's also, you know, I, know, I, I was. Oh, I don't like cover records by and large, but there have been a few cover records that were very meaningful for me. One of them was that Peter Gabriel "Scratch My Back" record, which yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Oh my God, that's yeah. a beautiful record. Oh, mm. and again, he just took them all and made them his own. And another one was um, the Jonathan Brooke covers record, um, "Back in the Circus," and she does. Again, it, it's one of those things where she made. Um, Eye in the Sky. She did a cover of that and just made it her own and took it, made you, he if you're going to do a covers record, you want to hear the song in a whole new way and not just be different for the sake of being different. I hate those tribute records where, you know, they'll, they'll get some, you know, like yeah. a punk band to do a Stephen Foster song and then they just yeah. scream it out. It's yeah, like, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just different to be different. But what did you add? Did you, why would I listen to that? So if you're going to do it, you have to make me want to listen to it. And um, anyway, that's what I, that's what I really wanted to do with this record. So, so if you're going to play the whole of this album in its entirety, so yeah. are there, are there other songs from your career going to be well, sprinkled I, in I afterwards? Got, I you know, I have to do old. I have to do some old October project, and uh, because going home. Sometimes you, I still run into people who have never heard me solo before, and so um, and I like to give the guys when I do. I mean, I do solo solo gigs around the country too. You know, just me and a guitar, and those are just you know <laughs> they're more intimate. You know, so, and I tell yeah. a lot of stories. But with I like to give the guys in the band different moments where they can really shine and do what they do. And so the October Project songs in particular, I let I can let them rock out, you know. And um, so, yeah, we do that. And of course, I do some of my own stuff that I've written as well. And uh, don't know what I'm going to do next. Thinking about it, starting to put some ideas together. Um mm -hmm. You know, I I have to tell you that facing the blank page is one of the scariest <laughs> things you know if you've ever written. It's like, oh man! And so you look for inspiration, you know, and and um, you you just you just have to show up and and do it. And you know, I've kept notebooks and everything, and we'll see what happens. Um, 
Fantastic. So your your albums are quite hard to find in the UK. So for the, for where's the best place Sorry for people to that. go? Yeah, that's all right. It's um, it, it's well, they can go to they can they can go to my website maryfall.com. I have a really good web store there, and yeah. uh, and of course, you know, uh, Amazon in the US has everything, but not obviously not in the UK. And, but uh, uh, if, if if people go to your website, they can also get signed versions, they can, can't they? And, they can get signed versions. They can de- they have they can download some of the stuff, especially the new record is downloadable there, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'd love, gosh, I'd love to come to the UK someday. One of these days, yeah, I'll, I'll do a little tour. But to everyone watching and listening, you need to buy a copy because you can get the 5.1 mix. And, of course, everyone needs to hear this, which is the dark side of the moon. Uh, are you are you, are you you going to do Like Us and Them or any tracks from, from that DVD, you yes, think? Yes, well, I always do. Even in my solo shows, I do uh, Brain Damage and Eclipse and wow. sometimes we throw in some of the other songs as well. Um, Mark really, Mark loves playing that, the stuff from that record. And every so often we'll do the, if we do two sets, not this time, but if we do two sets, we'll do the first half as a regular set. And the second half we come back and we do oh. the show. We do the entirety of Dark Side. <laughs> wow. And at the time when we got signed to V2, they, the guys from V2 Records flew up to Syracuse and we performed it for them in this tiny little rule box theater, tiny yeah. little but I, I had I had gotten the local university, their theater department. I called them up. It was the summer and said, is anybody there? Like, can I get some interns? And they <laughs> built a little stage for me. Wow. And I had I was dating someone at the time who put together all of these different films for me. And sort of, if you know the filmmaker Maya Darren, they're like weird. Yeah. You know, yeah. He's yeah. never taken a cinema course. So he put together these strange films and, but really well done. And so we had that going at the same time. And it was, it was sort of a multimedia experience. And so I still do that. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it, I wanted to make it a, a a real in-depth. I mean, we don't have the light show that a typical Pink Floyd would have, but there, the show is just incredibly fun to perform, and we'll we'll still do that on occasion. Perform the thing in its entirety. Yeah, because just before we finish on your live album, because I mean, there's like as opera, English folk, there's pop. Your is, yeah. is there a particular vocal style you're, you're happiest doing, or do you just see it all as part of who you are now? It's all part of you know who I am, and and. I, I, you know, I, I know it's odd that I would have gotten signed to a classical label to sing. I, opera is not my favorite, but I did do, um, I love French classical music and no one would ever, no one's ever going to sign me to a deal to do French, but just for my own self, I made a little record of French, you know, Debussy and Ravel and Satie wow. and, and um, I made it in a folky way. And uh, it's one of those things like, oh, yeah, you're, as if I wasn't eclectic enough, like throw that into the mix. But I have to say, if I had a favorite music to sing, it would be that because that's like the music of my soul. But I do it in a sort of like if Nick Drake did French, French classical music, it would sound like that. So that's that's what I've done. I'll, I'll release that someday. You know, well, um, that'll be well. That's something for us all to look forward to. I'll well, send you. I'll send you one of the cuts if you'd like. Oh yeah, to yeah, it. yeah. Yes, please. Well, thank you like so it. much, Mary, for all of your time, and I wish you the best for your upcoming tour and for this fantastic album, everybody, which you need to buy. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, and go to maryfall maryfall dot com um, where it's you can F-A-H-L get sign. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, but for all of us, for all of us um, in the UK, it's it's Mary Fall, but it's spelt F A H L. In case you go and Google and they can they can't find you straight away. Um, but thank you so much for your time um, today, Mary. It's been absolutely wonderful to talk to you. And please keep me informed with what how the tour goes. And hopefully, I'll talk to you again soon. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you so much for listening watching and being here for the Now Spinning Magazine podcast with me, Phil Aston, And a huge thank you to my guest, Mary Fall. And please check out her album, Can't Get It Out of My Head, which is highly recommended. Check out the Now Spinning website at nowspinning.co.uk. Subscribe 
to the YouTube channel, to the website, to the podcast, and join us also on our social media channels. And I look forward to seeing you on my next episode.